Brody Hubbard's video of the damned takes on in a violent nature. Y'all like this format with my static head there, headshot and the logo on the uh, split up footage. Um, this is pure vanity. I just don't like how I look and I was not getting the superimposed talking head to work. And so uh, we're doing it this way. Anyway. This is going to be as spoiler-free as possible. I will go in phases here and give you a heads up before moving on to another section in case you've heard enough and just want to go in as fresh as possible like I mostly got to. But first, the Stone Cold Facts, credits, horror bona fides of the cast and crew. In a Violent Nature is distributed by IFC Films and Shudder. It is the feature directorial and writing debut of Chris Nash, whose previous effort in those capacities was a segment in anthology The ABCs of Death Part 2. But get this, he was an on-set creature effects supervisor on Psycho Gorman, where he also played my dream role, Thug Number 3, and also took part in front of the camera for another Astron 6 film, The Void, though not Astron 6 as the editor, another video of the damned favorite. My point being that he runs with the crew that makes movies I particularly like. Pierce Dirks, the cinematographer, worked second unit or additional photography on a couple of those projects and also on Mandy. Editor Alex Jacobs did credits, titles, and graphics for installments of the VHS Anthology series. And as far as special effects and visual effects crews, besides, you know, Stephen uh, Kazansky from uh, Astron 6, but also, also the other folks, our credits include Jason X, Watchmen, and Black Adam, some of the other people associated with that effects crew. The ensemble cast is great. Uh, one of the characters is named Brody, spelled the same way as mine, by the way. Um, most of those actors have either short film credits and, not surprisingly, Canadian production credits. This is a very Canadian production. Um, a few of them have Astron 6 credits. Uh, I'd say the most interesting horror bona fide that I cannot get too deep into here because it would be a spoiler. Um, I will just say that a Friday the 13th Part 2 cast member shows up. You may or may not recognize them. We'll talk about them at the end. You can skip that part if you don't want spoilers. Now, plot-wise, stylistic speaking, uh, what I think everyone already knows about it, what it says on the tin, what I knew going in and was enough to get me to watch, it's being sold as an in-the-woods slasher, but from the killer's point of view, if you played the most recent Friday the 13th video game, yes, it's very much like that, although Chris Nash has said he's not particularly a gamer or inspired by video games. He's really talking about like Terrence Malick and Gus Van Sant. He's not talking about... Uh, video games. Um, of course, it's a bit more nuanced than that, so don't expect to be just over the killer's shoulder the whole time or see things from his eyes. I would say it's more of a limited third-person point of view, speaking in literary terms, but not a strict one. There are shifts at points, but again, to say more would be a spoiler. And there is both dialogue and uh, certain camera angles that we as the audience need to be privy to, which require more of an omniscient point of view at times. So again, this isn't you as the killer um, sometimes catching stray dialogue from NPCs to, again, put it in video game terms. Uh, though there are some scenes which may feel like that, and I'll talk in a little bit about how well-developed or not the characters in this are. There is no score. There is just diegetic music. That is, the only music you are hearing is what the characters hear in-universe from radios or boomboxes or Walkman, which, oddly enough, this takes place in modern times, even though I just mentioned somebody has a Walkman. There are iPhones and jokes about cancel culture. More on that in a second. Uh, but yes, most of the sound of the movie is actually nature itself, and eventually, of course, the sound of killing. Um, I'll only touch upon what mythos you can gather from the trailer or even from the first minute or so of the movie. I'll save the details for you to discover on your own when you see the movie. But I'll also talk about movies which it feels inspired by or reminiscent of without spoiling those movies either. Okay, so it's clear early on that someone takes a golden locket from a reputed burial ground, which unsettles a soul and unleashes your classic, non-speaking, very hulking, scary, walking corpse in tattered clothes. Everything you've heard so far should remind you of Jason Voorhees, of course. It's the most obvious influence. I heard a reviewer say this figure had the relentlessness of a, <laughs> relentlessness of a Michael Myers, and that makes sense because ostensibly the motion that sets the movie forth is Pursuit of the Locket. Um, 
But every incarnation I've seen of Myers, even though he is relentless in, in pursuing Laurie, he's a bit of a planner, a schemer. He operates a vehicle. He knows uh, addresses and names and faces and how to steal masks from hardware stores. Personally, I thought the killer of In a Violent Nature was more animalistic, like Leatherface. This is about the most primal killer I've seen in one of these films. There is that supernatural element and a mythos, the blueprints which were explicitly laid out for us in Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon. This movie would actually make a great double feature with that because, you know, if you want the academics and meta commentary first to give you the language to then appreciate the text of In a Violent Nature, uh, it's an exercise in celebration of those tropes just from a new point of view for this subgenre. Because we've followed psychological thriller killers before closely from Peeping Tom to Hatchet for the Honeymoon to American Psycho, but not this kind of killer from this type of perspective. And that's where I'm going to go, not into the specific kills, which I will also let you squirm at like I did not knowing for sure what's coming, just knowing something bad is coming. Uh, many Terrifier 2 fans, for instance, may have even heard before they saw that movie, look out for the bedroom scene. And there's a few of those type of highly stylized kills with nicknames and all, but I'll let you find them for yourself. I'll say that each one felt to me like it had some poetic irony. Um, so here's an example that didn't happen in the movie, but let's pretend there was a character with a peanut allergy in a, in a violent nature. He would probably get beat to death with a bag of peanuts. Um, so there's little touches like that, way more subtle than what I'm talking about, and like no Freddy Krueger welcome to prime time uh, remarks. If you grew up in a certain age of the internet, you may remember certain videos we were way too young to see and which would probably have messed up our heads even if we saw them for the first time as adults. Kind of like Rotten.com and Ogreish kind of stuff, footage from Mexico and Russia and the Middle East that makes faces of death look like goosebumps. You know what I'm talking about. That is what some of the kills felt like to me. I did not see the seams or the strings or the crash test dummy placed after a clever cutaway. Um, and because there's not that crashing jump scare orchestration or metal on metal sound effect cue to shake you as unspeakable horror occurs, it's almost like you're watching a lion eat a gazelle in a nature video, in a violent nature video. Get it? Yeah. Which isn't to say those kills don't have style. They do. I, I believe gnarly is the most common adjective being used right now. Um, but because the cinematography is so gorgeous, it doesn't feel like a Poughkeepsie tape or found footage kind of snuff deal, but it's still disturbing no matter how artistic. And the pacing's definitely a key to that. I've seen it described as slow burn. I don't know that I agree. There are time jumps and cuts to different angles. It's not that episode of The Bear where it's all one huge tracking shot in real time, but it's neither 80s slasher or 90s MTV quick cuts. But it's not Ed Wood watching a car pull up and park either. It's just simply that cadence you're not used to in these kind of films. Uh, but I still found it compelling and even more substantial as a result. I, I know other reviews don't agree. We'll talk about that too <laughs> in a bit. Um, so will you care about the victims? Are they just NPCs? No. Uh, but you can't truly shade out all three dimensions to them due to the limited time you have with them and limited perspectives you have on them. Uh, for the most part, for most of the movie through most of the scenes, you're only going to learn about them, what the killer could learn, overhearing them and observing them from afar, though it's uh, arguable uh, whether or not the killer has the faculties to perceive and comprehend uh, what they're talking about like we do. Um, but I thought the acting was strong. The banter we do get to hear is funny or intriguing. Um, I said, you know, there were some cancel culture jokes. There's also some juvenile humor. Um the, between the characters, that does feel natural. I've definitely seen lately movies I'm not going to review on this show that are overdoing the juvenile humor, um, and, and this felt way more natural. Um, the movie does establish their relationships with each other and some of their backstory, but a lot of it is left up to you to gather on your own. There's very little exposition aside from when we do get the mythos of the killer laid out for us in storytelling between characters. I'll also mention there are LGBTQ characters. It's treated very normal as it should be. You'll, you'll see a flirting scene between characters that would be just like any scene from it, like the 80s, that had one man and one woman. So that's perfect. And uh, 
Uh, you know, we've seen filmmakers like Troy Escamilla and Roger Connors and Christopher Moore give depth to victims and survivors in this genre. And we have famous final girls like Sidney Prescott and Laurie Strode that we've come to know and love across multiple films. But that's just not possible with the limitations of this format. But I think it's fine. Uh, so I've given you enough to see the movie, I think, with bright eyes. I'm, I'm going to say something here now for those who have seen it already, but I'll stay vague. Feel free to log off now and join me for a future episode if you'd like, but I'm confident I won't ruin it. So I'm going to go ahead and say this, okay? Ready? All right. If you're staying, here we go. There's an actor who shows up for what I have seen become the most divisive part of the film. I'm going to call it the overtly Texas Chainsaw Massacre-inspired part of the film. Um, and I would also like to give a shout out to my pal Emerald, who plays Kelly in Tear at Lake uh, Bigfoot Pond. <laughs> uh, she killed it in this exact kind of scene. Um, but anyway, there, there's a bit of a monologue, and some of it is used as narration in the trailer. And I know there are people who saw this movie who really did not like that whole scene, and they found the ending ambiguous. I, I didn't find it ambiguous. My, my feeling on why it was jarring for some was because you were so used to one point of view for so long throughout the movie and one certain style for so long, even with the change-ups here and there, that were necessary for other characters and events to be observed, that of course it felt like a juxtaposition when room was made for this monologue that is a bit of a th thesis statement for the whole film. Um, this is the no country for old men of it all, and that's straight from Chris Nash. So, Anyway, that actor who plays that character uh, is a character that got killed by Jason in Friday the 13th part two. So what do you think of that? Uh, so that is my review of in a violent nature, which I love very much. It's going to be, uh, and I know I already said this about Lisa Frankenstein, but I'm going to say it's going to be very hard for uh, something to beat in a violent nature as uh, my favorite, or at least one of my favorite 2024 horror films so that is all i have for now hopefully i will look prettier for you the next time i do some reviews and i do have some more movies to review for you soon but until then i will see you on the other side i remain hub and special thanks as always to stephanie the mother of morbidly beautiful you can catch her and all of our writers and podcasters on the morbidly beautiful network and at morebootlybeautiful.com. You can reach me on social media at Brody Hubbard.